and she has been working and in charge of social innovation. She has also done a lot of community building work. And today she's going to talk about her expertise as to how they have used and she has led Taiwan in social innovation around COVID-19. So Audrey, if you would be willing to share your screen, I will sh stop sharing mine and you can kick it off from here. Hello and good local time, everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be here virtually, uh, regardless of your time zone, uh, and looking forward to a conversation. Um, and as uh, the moderator have introduced, uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime using the Q&A for asking questions or using the chat for asking clarifications. And I'll just pause and take questions um, at any given point. So um, in Taiwan, we've had, uh, uh, I think, 10 COVID-related deaths. Uh, we've been essentially COVID-free since last April, uh, and we countered the pandemic this time with no lockdowns. And just as we counter the related infodemic, the conspiracy theories, communication failures, and so on, with no takedowns, um, we were able to do so because of the digital social innovation infrastructure that I will describe in the first section of this webinar. So the uh, digital social innovation has three pillars. It's very easy to remember, and I call it fast, fair, and fun. The first part pertains to collective intelligence. The collective intelligence allowed us to start this very early response. So as you can see here, uh, we started health inspections for flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan on the first day of 2020. We were able to do that because there was a doctor, Dr. Li Wenliang uh, from Wuhan, and uh, who said, and I quote, uh, there's seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market. Uh, but of course, um, it didn't quite save the people in Wuhan for well-known reasons of censorship, but he did uh, save the Taiwanese people because uh, a young doctor with the name No More Pipe reposted Dr. Li Wenliang's message to the Taiwanese equivalent of P uh, Reddit, the PTT discussion board uh, on December the 31st. Now, the PTT is interesting because it's a public digital infrastructure. That is to say, it's not um, funded by advertisers. Uh, it's not funded by surveillance capitalism. It has no shareholders uh, because it's just pet project from National Taiwan University students for the past 25 years or so. That is to say, it's co-governed, open source, and uh, people triage such incoming messages on PTT in a fashion that is um, pro-social rather than more anti-social corners of social media. So when Normal Pipe reposted the message, the professionals immediately started to upvote it uh, and uh, check its legitimacy and so on, and people conclude it's legit, and then our health offices started the flight passengers taking in this collective intelligence. And this says to me two things. The first is that, of course, the citizens must uh, trust each other enough, uh, and also the government enough, to talk about such a SARS 2.0 um, resurgence uh, in a public forum. And also, it also says that the government need to trust the people for surfacing such intelligence and responding in the here and now. And that's thanks to, according to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only fully open jurisdiction in all of Asia in terms of freedom of assembly, of the press, of um, art, uh, speech, and so on. And so we immediately started uh, around mid-January the Central Epidemic Command Center, or the CECC. The CECC is a design that we institutionalized in 2004 following the somewhat chaotic and very traumatic experience in 2003 when SARS first hit Taiwan. And so the CECC is basically headed by the commander, the Minister of Health and Welfare, you see in the middle, uh, and um, supported by all the local governments as well as all the mun um, municipalities, uh, all the ministries and so on who send secondment to the CECC. And it's powered by another collective intelligence system, the 1922. It's just a toll-free number, but anyone can call at any time after the daily 2 p.m. press conference by the CECC and ask any questions. In 2020, there's been more than 2 million phone calls uh, to 1922, and in a country with 23 million people, it means that anyone who has anything to ask or anything to report um, gets a empathetic uh, ear. And so, um, for example, last April, there was a young boy who called uh, and said, and I quote, uh, you're rationing out masks 
but all I get is pink medical masks. All the boys in my class in the primary school have navy blue medical masks, so I don't want to wear pink to school for I'm a boy. Well, the CECC、uh, immediately on the next 2 p.m. daily press conference,、uh, all the medical offices wore pink. The、um, commander, Minister Chen, even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the hippest boy、uh, in the class because only he has the color that the heroes wear, and the heroes heroes wear.、Uh, and pink for a while became the most hip color. And so this、uh, shows that if you have participatory accountability in the here and now, it can amplify the most controversial issues into not only gender mainstreaming but also popularizing mask wearing. In addition to the fast response, I would like also to highlight the fairness of the mask rationing system, and the fairness is guaranteed not just by the government but also by citizens, in particular civic hackers or citizen technologists. In early February,、um, there was a mask shortage.、Uh, we have 23 million people here,、uh, and at the time, it was just less than two million medical grade masks produced every day. And so, because of that,、uh, we thought about mask rationing. But even when we're still planning mask rationing,、uh, there's already a civic technologist. The name is Howard Wu from Tainan City,、uh, who just、uh, started this map. That shows the nearby pharmacies and convenience stores, and ask people to report whether it has run out of medical mask supply or it still have some, so that people do not have to queue in vain. And it lists both in the、uh, adult mask storage and also the availability of children. And so、um, this is great, but、uh, it gets reported on national media, and people started to use the service. And after just a day,、uh, Howard Wu owed Google twenty、uh, k US dollars in API usage fees.、Um, so he nearly went bankrupt,、uh, and then he went on to the G zero V or Gov zero community. Now G zero V or Gov zero、uh, is a Taiwanese citizen、uh, technologist collective. That is a very large chat channel with almost tens of thousands、uh, of people. I think nine thousand by the latest count on there, and, and each and every one of them look at the government digital service, which is always something that GOV, that TW, and think of better initiatives if. They don't like how the digital service works. They just make something that G zero V, that TW. So just by changing O to a zero, get into the shadow government, which is always open source and always more fun. So how we went to Gov zero, asking.、Um, so I owe Google twenty k US dollars. What do I do? And people start brainstorming on free software solutions.、Uh, but also because I'm part of the Gov zero、uh, movement, I just took his idea and sent it、uh, to the head of the cabinet. So I met with the. Premier saying we need to trust the citizens with open data, and we need to use our universal healthcare, national health insurance, and the IC card associated with it in order to implement the rationing system. And we need to update every thirty second in an open API. So this is not just open data; this is data that's published upon collection. So people who queue in the line in this pharmacy, if they queue here. And they see people swiping a national health card before them. They will see immediately that the 58 becomes 56, become 54, and so on. So if they notice anything wrong, they will call 1922 with their mobile phone right there. So to assure everyone that this distribution is fair, as we ramp up the mass production from 2 million a day to more than 20 million a day. In the end, there's more than 100 tools, maps, chatbots, voice assistants, and so on that's created to help people to locate the PPEs. And there's also independent analysis, such as this one, that showed whether there's a rural-urban distribution problem or things like that. So one case in point is that、uh, around March, when we're rolling this out. Uh, for a month or so, I look at the map, seeing the pharmacy centers and、uh, um, population centers almost perfectly overlap. So I thought it's a really good fit. But then、uh, there was a、uh, parliamentarian MP Gao Hongan. She, before joining the、uh, parliament, was the VP of Data Analytics at Foxconn. So she knows something about data. So in her,、uh, her interpolation, she asked the Minister Chen, saying, even though it looks fair on the Google map. 
if you use the open street map and zoom out, it's actually unfair because for rural people, in order to reach the pharmacies, even though it's the same distance, it's not the same time opportunity cost if they take public transportation, and that's true. Uh, and Minister Chen, instead of defending the policy, simply said, and I quote, um, legislator, teach us. Because it's evidence-based policy making, right? So OpenStreetMap community and MP Gao uh, did suggest, and we did implement just 24 hours after her interpolation, a new pre-ordering system that works with convenience stores that opens 24 hours a day. And also we uh, changed the distribution uh, algorithm with the pharmacies taking the rural transportation cost, uh, time cost into account. So MP Gao was very happy and said that um, yesterday's interpolation becomes tomorrow's co-creation again this ensures fairness in a way that everyone can participate so with the help of the convenience stores uh, we eventually implemented pre-ordering ic card uh, swiping at the convenience store also so we get three quarters of people uh, getting the medical mask and wearing them uh, by i think uh, early april and around that time our r value start to drop below one and that's when we uh, start to put this COVID 19 in control and finally, at the end of this section, I would like to highlight uh, the humor part of our communication because it is a stressful time and people do fill in conspiracy theories wherever and whenever they don't get uh, reliable information. So it's a, a like a fact uh, that is not there, that is missing, that is a void. So people just fill in with conspiracy theories. It's seen around the world and we're no exception. Uh, around April, there was a popular rumor in Taiwan that said, and I quote, the government is nationalizing mass production. This part is true. Uh, and the government is, will confiscate all the tissue paper materials to make masks. So we'll run out of tissue paper soon, unquote. Uh, turned out uh, we this was started by tissue paper resellers, but we didn't know that by then. So um, anyway, uh, we see that people going out, panic buying tissue papers, uh, not knowing that tissue papers and medical masks do not actually share the same uh, material. So within just a couple hours, using the triple two principle, uh, which says for each trending rumor within two hours, we have to roll out two different pictures, uh, different modalities, each 200 characters or less. And that uh, clarifies this issue in a way that's even more viral than the conspiracy theory. So our cabinet um, just wrote this out from the premier's office. You saw his front side, uh, Premier Su Zhenchang, and this is his back side. And he, um, I think, uh, wiggles his bottoms a little bit and says in very large font, each of us only have uh, one pair of bottoms. This is a, a wordplay because uh, in Mandarin to stockpile twin sounds the same as bottoms twin. Uh, and so this is essentially saying it doesn't pay to stockpile, can't use this much anyway. But this is the serious part that says tissue papers are uh, made out of South American materials and medical grade masks are made out of domestic materials. They're completely different materials. But because this is like hilarious, absolutely viral, so this reached far more people than the original conspiracy theory. And people who look at it and laugh about it uh, tend not to share uh, the original conspiracy theory anymore because their anger or outrage has been channeled into um, good humor, good fun. And by making himself literally the butt of the joke, uh, we inoculate, vaccinated uh, the uh, idea market uh, against such conspiracy theories. And this is what we do all the time. Because you see, in each ministry, we have a team of participation officers and who engages trending hashtags and so on, and professional comedians too. Um, and so this is a spoke dog, a very cute Shiba Inu uh, of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. And the dog uh, literally lives, is a companion animal uh, with the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. So what they do is that after each 2 p.m. press conference, they walk home, which is just a couple blocks away, uh, and take new fresh photos of the dog and say, for physical distancing, when you're outdoor, please keep two Shibas away. If you're indoor, please keep three Shibas away. Otherwise, wear a mask. And remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing and uh, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. 
This is very carefully crafted because it appeals to rational self-interest, especially because this was rolled out in very early, like February,、uh, where the airborne transmission or asymptomatic、uh, transfer these are not that well understood. But everyone understands intuitively. If you wear a mask, it's far less likely that you will touch your face with unwashed hands. So it links hand sanitation to mask use in a way that people will willingly share, voluntarily share, without appealing to collectivist、um, ideas like protecting each other, respecting each other, and so on. And so、um, after this meme、uh, gets rolled out, people who queue in a line to get medical grade mask do wear it all the time, and it's much easier for them to remind. One another, so、um, this is what we call the Taiwan model, and this concludes the first section of this、uh, webinar. And you can look、uh, at Taiwan can help that us for more material to support this part, the digital social innovation part of counter pandemic. Now, before we、uh, move on to counter infodemic, I would like to switch back and take maybe some questions. Sure, Audrey, that was excellent. And for those of us, including myself. Who don't have the good fortune of being in Taiwan? I have to ask: this culture, the culture of Taiwan, must have lent itself to the ability to create this fast, fair, and fun approach, because it seems extremely human to address the humor side of individuals. At such a serious time, so can you talk a little bit about the culture in Taiwan and how the government, as well as the people, are willing to be fast, fair, and fun at a very critical time? Certainly,、um, I think there are two main reasons. The first is that we remember thirty、uh, years old and older remember SARS in two thousand three. And when SARS first hit Taiwan,、uh, there was、um, I think seventy three、uh, SARS related deaths. We had to barricade、uh, an entire hospital unannounced.、Uh, the municipalities were saying completely different things、uh, than the central government. There was a panic buying of masks and so on.、Uh, so because of that, we、uh, institutionalized. The CECC, the communication plan, and things like that in law in 2004 in the.、Um The Communicable Disease Control Act, the CDCA,、uh, while the memory of SARS was still fresh. So that means that when people uh, invoke um, ideas like, for example,、uh, wear medical grade mask to protect oneself against unwashed hands, there is already a what we call societal inoculation, a understanding at least by people who are above thirty years old that this is actually necessary and this actually works. So that's、uh, what. Um, other countries are now、uh, going through. Right, everyone now <laughs> understands that mask is useful、uh, and it protects oneself against one's unwashed hands. So、uh, I think it's、uh, really important that people around the world institutionalize, as we did in 2004,、uh, whatever measures that people take in a、uh, time of crisis into the institution. So by the time SARS 3.0 comes,、uh, whether it's next year or a decade from now, that people still feel this calmness. Because we never declare a state of emergency. This is the second、uh, cultural、um, reason. People who are above forty years old, myself not included yet,、uh, about forty years old, remember the martial law.、Uh, and in the martial law, basically, administration do whatever, and the legislature doesn't really have interpolation or oversight power because it's essentially a soft authoritarianism. So, in any case, what I'm trying to get to is that in Taiwan, we do not declare. Clear a state of emergency if we can help it. We don't do lockdown if we can help it.、Uh, if we don't do censorship, we can help it because people collectively remember how bad it was、um, under the martial law. And so we have to、um, make humor work because that's literally the only more viral emotion than outrage、uh, on the public social media. If you do not、uh, have the the power to censorship, right? So because of that, we have to develop digital public infrastructure, and we do not、uh, rely on safe. Facebook, the more anti-social corner of social media. Instead, we cultivate the pro-social social media, such as PTT,、um, so that we can have a conversation、um, in a like a 
public park or the town hall, uh, the digital equivalent of such instead of the digital equivalent of, I don't know, nightclubs selling addictive drinks with private bouncers and things like that. So a emphasis on digital public infrastructure is also important. Excellent. Um, I have a follow up question to that. So it's obvious that there have been milestones throughout the culture that have rec caused a recognition, mm -hmm. a moment of recognition. Yep. And then there has been change that has happened and been executed. Mm -hmm. It's the sustainability of those changes that feels so impressive. Um, so like you had mentioned, people who are 30, people who are 40, but yet it seems like it's um, permeated throughout the entire culture, regardless of age. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how those changes have sustained themselves until mm -hmm. now so that you never have to call state of emergency? It's always this is we're ready for it. We're prepared mm -hmm. for it. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, of course, the, the cute Shiba Inu uh, transcends age boundaries, right? It's very popular with very young people, too. Uh, so, so that's definitely uh, one thing. Uh, we have a communication strategy that is predicated on getting the people the power to remix such messages. That is to say, we make the, the memes, right? The, the things that are funny, uh, but we do not restrict. Indeed, we encourage people to, to do better. Uh, alternatives, such as the Musk uh, rationing map. That is a culture of the, what we call the social sector of people caring and seeing maybe a PDF file of uh, you know daily uh, Musk rationing status. And that's neither accessible nor fun. So people will dedicate their time to make it more fun. I think the trick here is that we need to amplify the voices and the contribution of such social sector uh, technologists in real time. If we have to wait for a year, which is actually short by procurement cycle times, uh, in order to take their ideas into public infrastructure, then people lose interest. But if we um, use a what we call an agile um, strategy, so that people who suggest better ideas, like MP Gohong, who suggests a better distribution method, um, gets their idea incorporated next Thursday, because we deploy every Thursday. So anytime anyone have a good idea, we just say, okay, we'll implement that next Thursday. So this fast, rapid rapid response, I think it's also important to make this culture sustainable. And we're committed to it, not only in the participation offices, but also in the national regulations uh, for national open government plan and things like that. And we're quite fortunate that this is supported by all the four major parties in Taiwan. It's one of the very few things that they all agree on. Excellent. And my, my last question, um, do you feel there's an underlying trust among the community, each other with government that allows for these types of activities to flourish? Definitely. Uh, and I think the government should trust the people. The people may or may not trust the government. That's entirely fine. Uh, but if the government does not trust the people, if we say uh, we only do the auditing ourselves, we only do the visualization ourselves, we only do the PPE rationing ourselves, just blindly trust us, then it's actually showing a distrust to the people. And to give no trust is to get no trust. So I think uh, the main thing about trust is that it's earned. It's a a trustworthiness relationship uh, that is earned every time anyone checks on their phone a mask uh, distribution uh, experience uh, by swiping the national health card and actually seeing it decrease by two or three or nowadays ten. Uh, it's increased and any time that anyone calls 1922, more than 97 per, uh, percent uh, gets picked up uh, immediately. Um, I think we maintain 95 even on the height of the calls. Uh, and again, uh, by getting their concerns explained in a way that they could remember and share to other people, that also increased trustworthiness. So I think it's um, not not by a blind trust, but, but by um, a relational, like literally every minute, every 30 seconds, uh, in, increase of trust that's piecemeal, but increase over time. Excellent. Thank you so much for entertaining those questions. All right. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I've asked, yeah, oh, I've incorporated. Ask that. Oh, OK, I just, I just see the question count. Right? Yeah. OK, so if there's uh, no other questions, uh, I will move on to the next section. Okay, excellent. Excellent. All right, so uh, the next uh, section pertains to counter infodemic. 
um, the infodemic is not limited to pandemic or health related things. Indeed, uh, we faced a lot of disinformation in the specifically 2018 uh, mayoral election. And after 2018, we started this triple two uh, principle. And nowadays, on average, we get a clarification, a funny clarification from the competent authority, from the ministry, 60 minutes on average after each trending disinformation or misinformation that's detected online. So this is one example. Um, when Premier Su Zhenchang first implemented this triple two um, principle, there was a popular rumor that says, Perming your hair will be subject to one million dollar fine if you do it multiple times a week starting next week. This is of course not true. Uh, but then uh, Premier Su wrote out this meme that says it's not true. I may be bald now, he said, but I will not punish people with hair because I used to have hair. Okay, that's funny. Uh, and a, a small print that says what we introduce is a labeling requirement for hair products that takes effect on July 2021. So it's not punishing customers. And then the premier, as he looks now, says, however, if you keep perming your hair many times a week, while it's not uh, going to damage your bank account, it's going to damage your hair. Just look at me for what would happen to you. So again, by making himself literally part of the joke, um, well, not literally this time, uh, this, this is very viral. If you type in like perming hair, fine, whatever, um, you, you will see this meme instead of the conspiracy theory. So the conspiracy theory was stopped, um, I think just two hours uh, after its original introduction. So this is what we call humor over rumor. But how do we get a dashboard of what's going to trend uh, as disinformation? at any given time. Well, certainly not by surveillance uh, or censorship, right? So we rely on the community. Specifically, we rely on another Gov0 or G0V project called COFAX. COFAX, for collaborative fact-checking, introduce a function in the popular line, which is like WhatsApp, end-to-end -end encrypted chat channel, so that people can loan press and forward uh, it, flag it as spam. It's just like flagging your incoming email as spam, which is then sent to a spam house so that uh, incoming unsolicited email from that source uh, will send to your junk mailbox and people's junk mailbox instead of inbox. This does the same uh, to the end-to-end uh, -end chat messages because uh, when the R value is high, it first permeates all the end-to-end -end encrypted channels before it gets into the more public corner of social media, such as Facebook. And so because of this, if we can detect it when it's still in kind of incubating phase, before it mutates into something even more um, deadly or more viral, then we can develop vaccines uh, quick enough. So by people flagging things um, all the time, voluntarily, uh, they get sent the most trending ones because at any given time, there's only like three or four trending uh, conspiracy theories um, because the mental bandwidth is limited in social media. Uh, the Taiwan Fact Check Center, Michael Penn, and there's many uh, international fact check center professional journalist members, along with volunteers, they start fact checking it and then roll out this notice and public notice reports to clarify the issues. So that's how we get um, the, the first-hand responses, the immediate responses. And also uh, for advertisements, which are not quite uh, the viral disinformation, it's basically manipulated by money, uh, then we treat it as campaign donations, especially around election time. So our National Audit Office in 2018 started uh, after a long time uh, demonstration by Gov Zero people. Um, the National Audit Office did publish in open data the political contributions um, data set so that anyone could actually see for themselves how likely that uh, their uh, preferred candidate has spent campaign expenditure and so on um, to the social media campaigns and especially when that to use targeted advertisement. And because this is a norm that's set by the social sector, we turned and talked to Facebook saying that you need to do the same for the political and social advertisement during election because if you don't, it's essentially bypassing 
the campaign donation laws that restrict foreign sponsored propaganda during election time. And because they face, I guess, social sanction if they don't implement it, they did implement it by 2019, which is just in time for not only the COVID, but also our presidential election in 2020. So there was uh, almost no dark patterns um, compared to the 2018 election uh, in 2020. And we were able then uh, to share the clarifications, the real-time clarifications for all the political charged uh, disinformation campaigns and reach people in real time. So um, I will use one particular example um, that does that, and I quote, Hong Kong thugs compensation exposed. Killing a police earns you up to 20 million. That's a actual viral disinformation uh, in 2019, November. Now, uh, the fact checkers look at the photo and see actually is a real photo by Reuters, but the Reuters photo uh, on the left said nothing about being paid. It just said, uh, there's teenage protesters in Hong Kong, which is shaping, of course, to be the deciding uh, issue in our presidential election, January 2020. But this alternate caption, though, um, is something else entirely, and the fact checkers trace it very quickly back to the Weibo account of the Chang'an Sword, which is the Communist Party's central um, political and law unit uh, in the PRC. And so because of that, we immediately well, not take down because we don't take down things, uh, put a public notice out. So anyone sharing this on, say, Facebook, see immediately that this message is, you know, state sponsored propaganda. It's not what the original Reuters photo. Click here to learn more. So instead of shutting down its distribution, we encourage the distribution of the virus, but uh, we remove the toxicity of it by public notice, which is exactly how vaccine works. Uh, and so it serves as a vaccine of the mind so people understand there is information manipulation going on. Um, there's many cases such as during the election, uh, there was this disinformation that says um, the CIA is always the CIA made invisible inks to make Dr. Tsai Ing-wen win, uh, win regardless of who you vote. Again, this is countered with more transparency by making sure anyone in any party can witness the tallying counting process and take films of such counting process with their own apps in the two leading parties they have apps that gets reported in real time in all the counting uh, ballot boxes. Um, we make sure that people see the counting station before their own eyes and trust the YouTubers um, that are, of course, of the same party as they are. So the counts in the two major parties are very, very close, and that removes any potential for this conspiracy theory uh, to, to grow, because if there is an invisible ink, surely the YouTuber will have filmed it. And finally, during the COVID, we do have not only panic buying, but also phishing attacks. This is a cybersecurity attack that says if you share this uh, and uh, paste your contact number or whatever, um, then you will get contacted to get a free uh, box of masks. This is the height of the shortage in February 6. Again, people get computer virus, not masks, uh, if they uh, share their personal information with this bot. Again, this is cleared up by the real-time open API, so people can see that the rationing is fair, and with um, acceptable time opportunity cost, they too can get medical grade mask to protect themselves, and so on. So this is essentially treating the infodemic as a pandemic to achieve universal health coverage by having the primary schoolers not uh, attending media literacy classes, but media competence classes, where they're not just the viewers or readers, but active producers of media. They too can fact check the three presidential candidates during their um, debates and public forums. And we do have a lot of people who are not even 18 participating in such media competence um, efforts. And then we also develop the kind of vaccination, the notice and public notice of the vaccines of the mind. Humor is a vaccine too. And we find communicable diseases by banning foreign sponsored propaganda and advertisements, just as we ban campaign donations by foreign parties uh, during our election, our democratic process. So this is, uh, broadly speaking, applying the same strategy fast fair fun, not on pandemic, but on infodemic. So this is my second section, uh, and I'll again pause a little bit to take questions. 
First and foremost, I wanted to I wanted to say how impressed I am by the practical approach that you have. To, I mean, so unbelievably smart. Practical is not the right word. It's just when you speak and you describe the processes that you have, it makes so much sense that it's hard to imagine why everyone doesn't copy and use these approaches. So that's my question. Why not? Uh, first of all, I think many uh, more authoritarian polities do see infodemic and pandemic as a way to uh, expand the administration power uh, through state of emergency and so that. Uh, so that explains why our nearby jurisdictions don't always copy this way because this way is essentially empowering the social sector and the administration will not grow because the third party fact checkers and so on get legitimacy. The state also gets fact check all the time and other polities may not like that. But in other liberal democracies, democracies and social democracies. Um, I think uh, the main thing here is that unless you have, like in Taiwan, broadband as a human right, there's an argument that says by embracing digital democracy, digital social sector, and digital public infrastructure, are we not excluding the people who are not enjoying broadband access, who don't have uh, the capacity capacity to participate online uh, and things like that. And the answer, uh, the Taiwanese answer is, of course, anywhere in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, if you don't have 10 megabits per second um, in just 16 US dollars a month, it's my fault. Personally, it's my fault. Uh, and so I think this equality and equity in broadband access and media competence need to happen is a precondition for the inclusivity to happen. And that will make it part of the democracy. And that enables us then to think of democracy as a type of social technology, but not before. So a, a clever design of uh, spectrum auction rules and things like that to make sure that people do enjoy broadband as human rights, I think that's a precondition. Okay. And then um, you spoke about digital competency. Mm -hmm. what, is the, um, what is the type of curriculum that is mm -hmm. offered to individuals to have digital competence versus mm -hmm. digital literacy? Mm -hmm. Yes. The digital competence uh, pertains to share more, to curate more, and to produce more data. So this is, for example, um, we, we often talk about AI, and I prefer the term assistive intelligence, AI, um, like, like fire, right? It batch processes what we inefficiently process, uh, but it's also dangerous. It could cause uh, risks and so on, fire hazards. But the way we teach fire use in uh, democracies, at least, is to teach very young people, like six years old, cooking classes, sharing their recipes and so on, on the safe use of fire for public benefit. Uh, it's not just to uh, restrict the fire use to a few elites and so on. So in Taiwan, many primary schools uh, use, for example, the air box. The air box is a very inexpensive um, component of the climate science. And what it does is that it shares the PM 2.5 measurement on a um, MBIOT or LoRa zero G network to a distributed ledger. So before we had the Musk map, GovZero first had this um, air pollution map. And uh, thousands now, I think tens of thousands of primary schoolers um, maintained air box or contribute to a better understanding of the air quality in Taiwan so that we can uh, make better environmental um, arguments, I guess, and deliberations. And that means that people do not blindly trust the Environmental Protection Authority, which at the beginning of the airbox um, experiment, I think only had less than 100 measurement boxes. So the people um, are more legitimate when they produce more in a data collaborative. Uh, and the data collaborative, uh, again, I think teaches the young students to uh, be a global citizen, to contribute to sustainable development, and then imbue in them the this idea of data for public good. And that's just one example of the digital competence programs that we roll out as part of the curriculum starting 2019. Excellent. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions before we That's about one? it for now, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, so uh, on the third part, I want to talk a little bit about the assistive uh, intelligence before wrapping up. So um, when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen first became president in 2016, uh, she said, and I quote, 
before we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values. But now democracy must become a conversation become between many diverse values. So from this uh, opposition to co-creation, that is uh, the key to think beyond, for example, uh, environmental sustainability on one side and economy on the other, uh, scientific innovation on one side uh, and social equity on the other. Um, instead of framing them as trade-offs, we always ask a different set of questions. We ask, given our different positions, are there some common values? And this is my office, by the way, literally my office, the Social Innovation Lab at the heart of Taipei. Uh, and we always have co-creation meetings here because this public art by people with that syndrome, when you step into it, you automatically become more creative. Um, and um, this fosters, for example, people who work on self-driving vehicles instead of working on trucks or uh, large metros. We first work on this very small tricycles. They are very slow. They can't hurt people. Uh, and people walk by and maybe carrying flowers and so on because there's a nearby flower market. Um, I encountered a elderly couple who uh, look at this and ask me, Minister, what are you doing with those shopping carts? I'm like, this is not a shopping cart. You step on it, you tell it where to go. It's a driving, self-driving tricycle. And they're like, no, this looks like a shopping cart. And we have this very long uh, journey throughout the Jianguo Flower Market. I want to uh, change it so that I can shop flowers put into the basket and it can form a platoon and follow us as we shop. And by the end of that, uh, I'm okay for the bicycle to help someone else. So this is a sharing, not ownership model. Well, the makers from MIT who did those um, open data, open software and open hardware, self-driving tricycle certainly didn't anticipate this need. Uh, but we did work with the nearby Taipei Tech people in a couple of hackathons um, to make that actually work. Uh, and for that to work, they have to, for example, look at how people interact in real time in the flower market. They have to signify where who they are following and things like that. So this is a co-domestication. This is designed by the people who will benefit from this technology, not the technologist. And we always discover common values despite the initial different positions if we make sure everyone can participate in the co-creation process, which fosters an effective partnership. Now, uh, we have an institutionalized way to do this. This is called presidential hackathon. Every year, we select five teams, and the five teams are always trisectoral, uh, social, public, and private sector that work on a common issue. For example, last year, we didn't have any typhoon in Taiwan, so saving fresh water become very important. And turns out that in the Jilong region, uh, a small region when this pilot started, uh, it took on average two months before a water pipe leak happens and someone with this hearing uh, equipment listened to those pipes. And so we really need to shorten the two months into, well, two days. Um, after three months of co-creation, uh, people did a uh, assistive intelligence, AI chatbot, so the repair crew can wake up and uh, see the line bot, and the bot will tell them what are the three most likely 70% chance leaking places near them, so, so they don't have to uh, tour in vain. They can just like the mask availability map, I guess, go to the place that actually need human intervention. And they want this, um, trophy, uh, which is shaped like Taiwan, with a microprojector underneath. And if you turn on the microprojector, well, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, handing you the trophy. So this is a self-describing trophy. Uh, and what this trophy represents is not money. There's no money in the presidential hackathon. But whatever small-scale pilot the civic technologists did, they get a promise from the president, it will turn into a presidential promise. It will get implemented in the next 12 months using whatever budget, personnel, uh, or even law changes that's necessary. So this is essentially presidential executive order power as hackathon award. 
So the selection of the cases of the project is very important. We need to make sure it doesn't sacrifice anyone, right? So we uh, tap into existing data collaboratives, such as, as I already introduced, the Airbox initiative, and ask these uh, civic technologists if there is one budget item, one legislation, one personnel change uh, that will make your life much easier, what would that be? And can you prove it in a small scale that it will actually work with your theory of change? Change. So more often than not, using a new voting method, which I don't have time to go into called quadratic voting, um, more than 10 million active uh, participants in our national participation platform join GOVTW, collectively decide the top teams that makes into the incubation period of presidential hackathon, which covers marine debris, um, fraud detection, um, like safe and affordable housing, and so on. And all teams need to correspond to a specific sustainable Google target. There's 169 of them. So this ensures this is also of public interest to the world. Indeed, the water savior team eventually went to Wellington, to New Zealand, to also help their water company to cultivate such assistive intelligences. And when we select some place uh, for pilot testing, we always consult the people there. Indeed, we ask the people, what are the agenda that you would like such social innovations uh, to solve first? And so I personally tour around Taiwan every month or so. In addition to the weekly Wednesday uh, office hour in the Social Innovation Center, I also tour around Taiwan so that I listen to the people sometimes with indigenous language uh, cultural translators. Uh, but in the Social Innovation Lab, the central government people, 12 ministries, all are in this place. We use telecommunication to weave uh, the very rural place and the central Taipei city together so that we respond to the here and now. Because then the Minister of Interior, for example, wouldn't say, I understand your concern, but I have to talk to the Minister of Health and Welfare, for the Minister of Health and Welfare is literally sitting you know, next to them. right? So so we just had a, a large gathering of all participation officers, around 100 people, in the Social Innovation Lab last week. And this is a horizontal network that ensure that all the local issues that needs this cross-sectoral solutions reach the uh, competent authorities in a way that's uncompressed, that is literally face-to-face -face communication instead of just as A4 papers, either as documents or as slideshows, which tend to over-abstract, over-simplify the issue. And this is how we use teleconferencing to ensure a responsive and inclusive decision making. The public servants love this arrangement because they don't have to um, travel physically and also uh, across the screen people behave much more civilly uh, than the face-to-face -face communications sometimes. Anyway, uh, and so when we do uh, have a sandbox that's selected by the presidential hackathon and try out for the first time uh, after three months or half a year, how do we know whether it actually makes um, good sense. How do we know whether the people there likes the idea? What, what does that even mean if they like it? We can, of course, design some surveys, some posts, but that, of course, reflects the bias of the person designing the survey. So we use instead a wiki survey, a new survey system called POLIS, and the name is P-O-L, that I-S, it's now a national public infrastructure uh, at polis.gov.tw after we did a cybersecurity audit and so on. So the polis system, first used in 2015, is an assistive intelligence conversation tool. This is a real map that you're seeing in 2015, the first time we're using it, to deliberate the UberX case. At the time, the ministries of economy, of taxation, and of finance, transportation, all have very different views on the UberX phenomena. Some ministries think it's gig economy. Some think people think it's platform economy. Some people thought it's sharing economy, sharing time at least. Uh, and there really is no way for us to uh, map the emerging technology to what's existing in the law. So the law obviously should change, but how should it change? So we ask people to use their phone, and this is my friends and families, my social media friends, and the clusters are the different takes, the different feelings they have on the UberX phenomena in 2015. We first share all the facts, the um, open data, real-time open data on transportation and things like that. But using Polis, we ask for people's feelings. Uh, and this is important because there's no right or wrong about feelings. 
around the same flag. I can feel happy. You can feel upset. That's all fine. And once we give people sufficient time to reflect on each other's feelings, ideas will emerge, and the best ideas are the ones that take care of most people's feelings, which we then turn it into regulation. So, for example, this and this is the pro-social part of social media. Uh, you will see a fellow citizen's feeling, and I said, I think passenger liability insurance is very, very important regardless of whether UberX hires professional drivers only. You can agree. If you do, you move toward me. If you disagree, you move farther away from me. But there is no reply button. And with no reply button, there's no room for trolls to grow. There's no way to make a attack, a personal attack to me. If you don't like my idea or my feeling, you can propose another one for other people to vote on. And the magical thing is, in the a situation like this in a pro-social conversation method, there is maybe like five ideological divisive statements uh, that polarize the population, but far more people agree with their neighbors most of the time on most of the things. And this is not a Taiwanese culture thing. This conversation is a civic assembling uh, uh, in the online as a virtual town hall in Bowling Green, Kentucky, USA. Um, and regardless of whether people identify as Democrats or Republican, uh, people all agree that the existing STEM education, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, need to become STEAM. The arts are an important part of it because it's creative, it's part of the competency. Uh, more diversified broadband, broadband as human rights, um, is again a cross-partisan thing. And there's far more these things than the national media uh, or social media or anti-social media uh, would lead us to believe. And so once we do have this rough consensus, we would then invite all the uh, like Uber drivers, taxi drivers, and so on, and say, well, this is the rough consensus of the people, and we need to make this regulation happen, And which is why Uber has been legal for a while now. It's a legal taxi, the Q taxi in Taiwan, but they never undercut existing meters, and the multi-purpose taxi law also benefits the existing co-ops and line taxi and so on. So this is like a KPI a measurement of progress that's crowdsourced, is crowdsourced agenda setting. Uh, that's what enable us to assist the collective intelligence or ACI and turns the societal and the business concerns not in polarizing the, uh, directions but in co-creating directions. So, um, and I guess this is the conclusion uh, of the webinar. Uh, I would uh, emphasize that um, even though there are 17 global goals, my uh, training and my focus is on the 17, which is the partnership for the goals. Uh, and what we're now doing is to make availability of reliable data, effective partnerships, and open innovation work so that people with different sides not only come to common values, but can innovate to foster those values without leaving anything behind. Um, so that's um, the end of my material, and uh, let's take some more questions. Sure. Um, how do you think that the, the IT infrastructure, um, infrastructure under your leadership has contributed to containing COVID-19 spread? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, first, it's an assistive role, as I explained. The most important technologies are definitely um, soap, hand sanitizers, uh, vaccines, <laughs> and digital is a supporting role. Uh, but uh, the digital uh, supporting role is important because it gets people into this sense of calmness, of uh, not being distracted by conspiracy theories, of getting what they need uh, to tell their friends and families from the uh, leading epidemiologist. Uh, indeed, we have uh, our then vice president, uh, Dr. Chen Jianren, record a massive online open course on epidemiology, for he is the textbook author of the epidemiology uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so by having a VP and a leading epidemiologist, uh, giving people time uh, and a a kind of massive online open university lecture and so on, we make sure that the truth, the facts, 
the science spreads faster than rumors. So that's the first contribution. And the other contribution is that we also make sure to use technologies to simplify the chores that one need to go through. For example, in ensuring home quarantine, uh, in ensuring the uh, reporting of people who need to stay in the same place for 14 days uh, and take care of themselves uh, for seven more days and so on. And we use, for example, the digital fence, um, which is a SIM card uh, telecommunication tower enforced uh, triangulation method that does not read, uh, for example, WhatsApp or email communication because it's not an app. What it does is repurposing existing data collection points, um, which is the uh, telephone towers sending advance warnings for earthquakes and flood evacuation and turning it into the same location-based warning system for people breaking out of quarantine. And so people understand that already. There's no a, a new cybersecurity or private um, touch points that we invent during the pandemic. So that again uh, makes people feel that even though the 14 days is kind of, I guess, painful, uh, but there's Netflix, <laughs> Bravo as human rights helps with that, and it's applied with equity. Okay, so um, throughout today's webinar, you've mentioned con conspiracy theories mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah, like 10 times. From conspiracy, <laughs> from conspiracy <laughs> theories to Digital, um, digital tools, technology infrastructure, healthcare. What do you think has compromised the efforts of other countries most? Mm -hmm. Is it these? Is it conspiracy theory because it, it drives misinformation? Is it lack of technology, lack of di digital tools? What What would you say? What do you think is the most prevalent reason? I think it's the government not trusting the citizens enough. That's the, the root cause. If the government uh, issues top-down, well, lockdown, takedown, shutdown, uh, orders, uh, without people understanding the underlying epidemiological reasons, the underlying science, and so on, people are going to fill in the void anyway. That's what I refer to as a void of facts. Uh, and that's what makes it's ripe for the conspiracy theories to grow. So the conspiracy theories are a symptom. It's not a cause by itself. I think the cause is the lack of trust from the government to the citizens. And if we work for the people, but without working with the people, uh, then the people always have you know, more information sources that feels closer than the government. Uh, and in Taiwan, we realize we can't beat them, we must join them. So we always work with the people instead of for the people. Indeed, in civic technologies like the air box uh, map and the mask map, we work after the people. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I don't have any other questions at this time, but um, Audrey, this was so very enlightening. Um, what a great Sunday night. I did not expect to have such a great time <laughs> being here. And I've learned so much, so many great comments coming through. Um, if, is there anything else that you'd like to share, sure. even if it's some sure. humor? Yeah, to sure. leave, leave yeah, maybe I'll write some, uh, something uh, that uh, explains these uh, sustainable goals. Nowadays, the SDGs are more well understood. But back in 2015, when I declared these are my work uh, description, my job, um, the HR people said, uh, Minister, you have to write it in plain language. Nobody memorizes 1718, 1718, or 76. So I wrote a prayer, a poem that translates these SDGs uh, into um, I guess, plain language, and I'll, I'll share it now, uh, at, which is also pinned on my Twitter. It goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening and live long and prosper. Thank you so very much. This was such a treat. All of you who have joined us today, thank you for your time. I know that you have learned so much today. 
After the session is over, you will receive a survey. So for those of you who are joining and looking to get contact hours for today, can complete that survey and we will make sure to follow up with you. Audrey, anytime you wanna do this, count me in. This was just wonderful. Excellent, thank you for the great questions. Have a thank great you. start of the week. Thank you all for being part of this event and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.